lesson two today. Remember, we're dividing the lessons up into two parts because there's so much in the book of Romans. So we're on lesson two, starting with Romans chapter two, verse one. It says, Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whoever, whosoever thou art that judgest, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself, for thou that judgest doest the same thing. In the book of Romans, we need to realize and understand the mindset of the Jews, the Jewish people, especially for the first 500 years. The Gentiles were not friends of the Jews. The Jews looked down on the Gentiles. Acts 10.28 says, And he said unto them, this was Peter, You know how that is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or to come unto one of another nation. But God has showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. So, if you were not a Jew, you were common or unclean. And this was a problem. So, we have a judging problem here. Judging for us is a natural thing, is it not? What we as a child of God need to rethink how we evaluate situations. You know, we can judge on a lot of different things. We can judge on how a person dresses, the car they drive, the house they live in, all kinds of different things. I have a problem. <laughs> These people that uh, are on the curbside with a sign saying food and all this stuff in my mind goes back to there's all kinds of job opportunities for a good price nowadays. And I judge that person. I don't know one thing about him. Is that right for me to do that? <laughs> no. Anyway, judging is something we really have to be careful about. And this was a big problem for the Jews, judging the Gentiles. Now, James 4.10 says, Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. Speak not evil one of another, brother, and he that speaketh evil of his brother and judges his brother speaketh evil of the law and judges the law. But if thou art a judge of the law, art thou not a doer of the law, but a judge? For there is one lawgiver who is able to save and destroy, and who art thou that judgest another? So we see a condition here of mankind as in Romans 1, 18, 32. And all the problems that occur come with it in individuals, in churches, in governments, you name it, whatever it is. So what is the problem with our world today? Why are we in the shape we're in? Isn't it not because of two things, I believe. Unbelief and apathy. Unbelief of those that don't accept Christ as their Savior and don't believe in God. And apathy of the Christian. What does it say in Second Chronicles 7.14? If my people who are called by my name will, what? Humble themselves. What else? If. And I don't believe that's happening. So, getting back to the problem Paul was trying to address here, I believe. If we say, fail to see the Jewish mindset as God is bringing forth both Jew and Gentile into one body, which is the church now. Can you see the problem? All these years there's been a separation. The Jew is better than the Gentile for a lot of different reasons in their mind. Now they're coming together. Some Jews are getting saved. 
Remember at uh, Paul was speaking to the church at Rome, believing that these Jews were a Pentecost. They got saved. They came back. A church and some Gentiles. So now we have an intermingling and we have a problem yet. So Paul is stressing this. First of all, the Jew had been in bondage under Gentile rule for years and years and years under the Babylonians, the Medes, the Persians, through Greece, and then through Rome. Remember when Jesus came, they said, Ah, we're saved. You know, we're saved. Jesus is going to set up his kingdom in Rome, take over. Well, that wasn't the cause. That wasn't what he was there for. And so they were still under that leadership, you might say, of Rome. So the Jews were zealous of the law and their tradition. And there was no place for a Gentile in that. So there was a problem. And there still is today with Orthodox real Jew Jews. I have a uh, new doctor and he is Jewish. <laughs> and uh, he wears a little beanie you know, and the whole thing dresses in black. And that's not a problem with me. <laughs> But anyway, there just seems to be a wall there of some sort. Maybe it's my own imagination. But anyway, James 2.1 says, My brethren, have not faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. And again, this is the problem we're talking about. Respect of persons. Romans 10.12 For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto them that call upon him. So Paul keeps bringing this up through Romans. The difference between the Jew and the Greek or the Gentile. Same thing. Okay. So trying to convince and that's what he's trying to do. Convince who? The Jew, which is a religious person in their own thinking, a person that's chosen, the chosen people of God, a keeper of the law, they thought. And then they're supposed to be on the same plane with this Gentile? <laughs> Come on. So you see the problem. You know, in chapter 3, starting in the Romans road. What's the first verse in the Romans road? For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. In this verse, in studying Romans like this, in this light, I can understand, you know, going further down into that chapter, he brings up the Jew and the Greek again. The difference between the two. So anyway, they were quick to judge the actions of the Gentile believers while they overlooked their own sins. Does this apply to us? <laughs> Can it apply to us? Do we judge others? By whatever. I don't care what it is. If you judge others, it's, you're judging others. Whatever the reason is, it's wrong. It's wrong for me. It's wrong for you. It's wrong for all of us, according to the Word of God. Bob? One of the things we have to realize about the Jews, they were judging people on their rules. They call it the law. Yeah. But they made the law into something different than God intended. Jesus said over and over and over, in John's account of the gospel, that Jesus told them over and over, you judge according to your opinion. You aren't supposed to judge others that way. God gave us his word. God's already judged what's right and wrong. We have a responsibility to stand for what the word says when we talk to somebody. We're not judging them. We're showing them what the word says. 
But if we're judging from opinions, like you said, clothing, things along that, yeah. that's the kind of judgment that the Jews were doing. If we didn't fit into your pattern of what it was all about, then you're wrong. If you judge according to what the Word says, then you're right. And yeah. you're just showing what God's Word teaches. That's our responsibility. Matthew 28, 18, 19, and 20. Yeah. Yeah, right, exactly. That's uh, good, Bob. Thank you for bringing that out. Because there's a difference between judging what God says and what our opinion is. Well, keep going to Matthew chapter 7, and it says, Judge not that you be not judged. Yeah. And if you go back into the context of what he's saying there, he's telling you that you're not supposed to judge according to yours, because one of these days, you're allowed to be judged. Yeah. According to that very same thing, judge for the right reason. Yeah, in Matthew, you're right. Judge not that ye be not judged. And then verse 2 says, For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged, and with what measure ye met, it shall be measured to you again. Exactly. So, need to be careful. All right, verse 2 of Romans. Chapter 2, but we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. Now God is impartial. As transgression is to the Jew, it's no more or less criminal than transgression of the Gentile. The same. So God judges according to the truth and fact with no exceptions. No plea bargains. That's another thing that sticks in my crawl. A man does something and it's wrong and then he plea bargains and gets off with it. Either entirely or partially. Does God work that way? It's either right or it's wrong. <laughs> You're judged according to the result of truth and fact in God's eyes. No plea bargaining. God will deal with all men equally according to the word. Then let's look at verse 3. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judges them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? In Romans 14, 4, it says, Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holding up, for God is able to make him stand. So God is the one that determines how a lot of things that we don't know. We don't know. Do we know for sure if a person is saved? When a person repents, do we know for sure that he means it? We don't know. So when we start judging people on the basis of what we think we know that we don't know, we got a problem. I got a problem. So no one knows, no one, the motive or heart of man. Right? We don't know why people do things. We start judging why we think they do things, we got a problem. Uh, whatever it is. So, we are all sinners and under judgment, but God is merciful to all through believing the truth of God. Would we think any different if we knew people could read our thoughts? Sometimes we forget God can read our thoughts. So we might not be judged by the person we're talking to and saying one thing and thinking another, but God does. So we need to be careful of that. So anyway, back to the Jew. The Jews had a hard time adjusting to this new way for them. Again, they had put themselves above the Gentiles because of their position. So, it 
would be impossible for those who have the law to escape the righteous judgment of God after violating the law themselves. Could the Jews keep the law? Did they think they kept the law? <laughs> yeah. You know, it was like the Ten Commandments. Well, I keep this one, this one, this one. Well, this one I don't, this one. Well, either the whole or none. One or the other. So we need to do the whole of what God wants us to do. The sin nature in the Jew is the same in the Gentile. And they're no better. Paul's trying to bring this out. You're no better. Let's look at verse 4. <clears throat> or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. God has forbearance and long suffering. Was this something new with God? No. He's always had that. We study the uh, Old Testament and what the Jewish people did when they moved into the promised land God was merciful to them over and over and over they'd come to a point where they would repent and God would be merciful to them so Isaiah 30 18 says and therefore will the Lord wait that he may be gracious unto you. Therefore will he be exalted that he may have mercy upon you. For the Lord is a God of judgment and blessed are they that wait for him. So he waits for us and he waits for us and he waits for us. I was 29 years old before I got saved. He waited for me. Am I glad he waited for me? Yes, I am. <laughs> Very glad. So, instead of the Jew being a judge of the Gentiles, he himself needs to repent. And it's the same way with us. We need to repent instead of being a judge of something or someone. And the same goodness what saves the Gentiles will also lead the Jew to repentance if they will. Their eyes for now have been blinded because of their continual rejection. But there are a few that have accepted Christ. A few. So it's not in the rituals of washing of water, purifying, or demands from the hypocritical Sanhedrin or the Pharisees to comply with the law to be right before God. But it's repentance from the heart and accepting Christ, doing what's right. Was Abraham saved by the law or by faith? He was saved by faith, wasn't he? Not by the law. Why? Because he didn't keep it either. <laughs> no man can. Let's look at verse 5. But after the hardness and impertinent, impenetrant heart treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Hardened heart, a stubborn, unrepentant, insensible mind and heart does not appeal to change. The harder it gets, the harder it is to change. And I think we've probably seen this in different people that we know. People who were once on fire for the Lord. And then they backed off a little more and a little more and a little more and a little more heart just continually got hardened. I don't know of anything, I don't know if you do or not, left to itself improves. Does it improve or does it decay? 
you walk away from your house totally and you come back two years later, what's it going to look like? <laughs> That's the way it is with our heart. We walk away from God and it gets harder and harder and harder and harder and harder for us to go back. But it only takes one mindset of I'm done with myself. <laughs> I need to get back. And God takes us back. Welcome home. We have such a good God. By passing judgment upon others without mercy or forbearance, the Jews being guilty would bring the wrath and judgment of God upon themselves. And again, we can apply this to ourselves today. Hebrews 3.13 says, But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. While it is said today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation. Provocation. What was the provocation? Time during the wilderness. And we know what happened during the time of the wilderness. Children of Israel rebelled and rebelled and rebelled and rebelled. So the church today needs to be in unity, not divided by judgmental issues based on our individual thoughts or specific group thoughts, our own thoughts, not what God says, but what we think. All right, let's look at verse 6. Who will render to every man according to his deeds. He's talking here about Jew. Gentile doesn't make any difference. Romans 14, 12 so, says, So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And let's look at verses 11 through 15. Someone want to read that, please? <clears throat> First Corinthians chapter 3, 11 through 15. For other foundation can no man lay than his way, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build unto this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built there thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Okay, so we're not talking about loss of salvation here. We're talking about what have we done. This is for the saved. How about the unsaved? Turn to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20. And we have the same verses 11 through 15. Someone want to read those? Revelation 20, 11 through 15. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books 
according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Okay, so there's judgment coming. In relationship to what we're talking about here, judging others, we should not be engaged in condemning our brethren, but should examine whether we are prepared to give an account with joy and not grief. We have to give an account. All judgment will be conducted by the Lord Jesus. John 5.22 says, For the Father judges no man, but hath committed all judgment to the Son. And in verse 27 it says, And hath given him, the Lord Jesus, authority to execute judgment, also because he is the Son of Man. Christ is going to be our judge. Okay, let's look at verse 7. It says, To them who by patient continuance and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. So patient, continuous, and well-doing of faithfulness to God, seeking spiritual things that would honor God. These people, hopefully us, if we seek that, we'll enjoy eternal life with all its benefits. Also, the benefits that we have now as a Christian. Do we have any benefits as a Christian? <laughs> we have many, many, many benefits. Look at the benefits that we have over the unsaved compare them. Spiritual benefits totally but just benefits of life. Benefits of knowing the word and knowing how we're supposed to live. Benefits of the Holy Spirit that convicts you. Say Marvin you knew better than that. <laughs> we just have so many benefits. Peace. Peace of God passes all understanding. And on and on and on and on. So our focus ought to be on doing what's right instead of finding fault and judging others. Let's look at verse 8. It says, But unto them that are contentious, and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath. So it's in contrast to verse 7, who seeks after spiritual things. Different views of life. Those that are against, they strive against God, resist Him, have a willful disbelief in God and rejection of revealed truth that he has for them, for us. Contentious, ready to argue, quarrelsome, provoke, disobedient to the truth, obey injustice. You ever tried to witness someone and all you get is a quarrel? Argue argue, argue, or get you off track some way. Okay. So their reward is not good. Romans 1.18 says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Now, let's look at verse 9. Tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil, of the Jew first, and also of the Gentiles. And now, 
Paul is referring back to the Jew again. Keeps doing this. Now Paul brings the fact of the consequences of evil is not only to the Gentile, but to the self-righteous Jew. Now, tribulation or trouble and persecution, anguish, calamity, and distress on every man. He does not exclude the Jew, but puts him first. Why does he put him first? Against these common, unrighteous, unholy Gentiles. Why does he put them first? John 1.11, what does it say? He came unto his own, his own people, and his own received him not. They rejected him. They rejected Christ. But, verse 12 says, as many as received them, to gave the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Doesn't matter, Jew, Gentile, whatever. Anyone. Deuteronomy 7, 6. Why does he put the Jew first? It says, For thou art a holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all people and upon the face of the earth. Deuteronomy 7, 7 says, The Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you, because ye were more in number than any people, for ye were the fewest of all people. So God chose them first. Verse 8 says, But because the Lord loved you, and because he would keep the oath which we had sworn unto your fathers, hath God brought you out of the mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of bondage from the hand of Pharaoh the king of Egypt. So, to the Jew first. And remember, because of what they have done in their past, their eyes are blinded, except a few. So judgment for the unsaved will be the same for Jew and Gentile. It doesn't make any difference. Let's look at verse 10. It says, But glory, honor, and peace to every man that worketh good. To who? The Jew first. <laughs> and also to the Gentile. So the Jew is first. Glory, honor, and peace instead of tribulation and anguish in obedience to God. Doesn't matter, Jew or Gentile. So every man that worketh good, that lives in a conscientious obedience to the known will of God, whether he be Jew or Gentile, shall have glory, honor, peace, and internal blessings. Godly and believing Gentiles shall share, share, yeah, with believing Jews, glory, honor, and peace. No difference. Let's look at verse 11. For there is no respect of persons with God. This is what the opposite belief was of the Jews. Acts 10 34, then Peter opens his mouth and said of a truth I preserve, perceive that God is no respecter of persons. Back to the Old Testament Deuteronomy 10 7 for the Lord your God is God of gods, Lord of lords a great God, a mighty and terrible which regardeth not persons nor taketh rewards. Colossians 3.25 But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done. There is no respecter of persons. 1 Peter 1.17 And if ye call on the Father who without respect of persons 
judgeth according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning here with fear. So God is going to deal with the Jew and the Gentile and the justice, what's right. No partiality with God based on earthly status. Doesn't matter about race, creed, or color, size, or anything else that we might think of. God will not judge on that. Verse 12 says, For as many as sin without the law shall also perish without the law, and as many as sin in the law shall be judged by the law. So faith in Christ was not determined by keeping the law. Right? The Jew was given the law, but could not keep it. The Gentile was given the law. But they couldn't keep it, even though it was not given to them. So both will perish under the law. Now, Galatians 2.16 says, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might justify by the faith in Christ and not by the works of the law for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified again who thought they were keepers of the law the Jew right did they keep the law again no and Paul keeps bringing this out <laughs> because we're supposed to have a mesh here now of saved Jew and Gentile in the church, in one body. And this is, this is the situation Paul's trying to get on top of here. God is trying to speak to these things through Paul. Let's, verse, let's look at the... Well, Psalms 14.3 says, They are all gone aside. They are all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Isaiah 64.6, But we are all as unclean things, and our righteousness are as filthy rags, and we do fade away as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. So, you know, when it brings out our Righteousness is as filthy rags before God. What righteousness do we have? Christ in us, right? That's the only righteousness we have. That's how we're justified through the blood of Christ and Him applying that to us. Okay, let's look at verse 13. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. Matthew 7.21 says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but hath he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. James 1.22 But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Like I mentioned before, Abraham was not judged, justified by the law, but by faith. No man can be justified by works because no one can keep it. Let's look at verse 14. For when the Gentiles which have not the law do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves do by nature or the natural thing what are we talking about here Romans chapter 11 verse 24 says for if thou wert cut out of the olive tree which is wild by nature for olive tree it's wild it's wild and it's wild by nature right 
It's like a lion is wild by nature. And we're grafted contrary to nature into a good olive tree. How much more shall these, which is the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? In other words, you don't mix the natural with the unnatural. What he's saying here, there's a difference. How much more shall these, which be the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? The natural branches, the Jew be grafted in, except Christ is their Savior. So anyway, the Gentiles who did not have the law had a heartfelt understanding of their sin and their need for salvation and trusted Christ through faith, not the law. God gives us a conscience. Reasoning, doesn't he? He gave us a brain for something. We need to use it. But he gives us a conscience. And they knew what was right and what was wrong. Let me give you an example of when Adam and Eve sinned against God. They tried to hide from him. Did they not? Genesis 3, 7. And the eyes of both of them were open and they knew they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. How did they know they were naked? Did God say, when you sin, you're going to know you're naked? <laughs> no. Conscience. They knew. For conscience sake, you know. They just knew. God-given conscience. They knew. God said, and he said, Who told you thou art naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree where I commanded thee, and thou shouldest not eat? So they knew. Romans 2.15 says, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the mean, while accusing or else excusing one another. So their conscience bearing witness. So, though the law was not revealed to the Gentile, as to the Jew, yet they obtain the knowledge of them by the light of what God has given them. Conscience, reasoning, conviction of the Holy Spirit. Started out where God said, no man is without excuse look into the heavens. If anyone wants to see God, God will reveal himself to them. If anyone wants to reject God, that's what will happen. God will try and woo them back in various different ways. But it's still our decision. So, next week, we go to the second half of Romans 2. We'll look at that. But anyway, this week, basically, be careful how we judge people. Be very careful on our own opinions, what we think, and don't think we're better than anybody else. Any comments, questions? Thoughts? All right, Brother Frank, to close in prayer.